So here we are uh, on the 7th of October. We're quite a fair way into the um, start now. We've done all the tilling and everything on the ground. We've prepped it. Um, we've had a sort of a moderately average <laughs> strike on the, the, the cover crops. Uh, just because we had a real, really um, dry, we didn't get a lot of rain after we sowed them and then when it did rain, this is what we got. But it's still good enough for what we um, invested in it. Um, but the main takeaway right now is the poor condition of the pasture and the grass. It's very poor. So as it stands now, it's not going to support a crop. It's not going to create enough biomass to make a, to cover the soil adequately to support a crop. So we have to feed it. Now you can see here these bigger pieces of grass, bigger clumps of grass, and you can see them throughout the paddock there. That's where the cow manured, where the cattle were on it about two months ago. So what we've got is a um, situation where the, the it's poor. You know, these paddocks have been had too much taken off them and not enough given back over a long period of time. Um, and so uh, we have to give it some liquid fertilizer. That's the next step in what we're up to. Um, so, you know, we hoped for the best that we'd get a good grass recovery. That didn't happen. Uh, so we have to invest in the primary energy source for the placenta um, phase of um, this uh, syntropic uh, enterprise, which is to invest in the grass. Of course, in standard agriculture, we'd probably get, um, in standard organic, we'd probably truck in about ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of compost and put it on all of the rows and then start growing. But we're regenerative, we're not going to do that. But um, yeah, you can see where those manure, where the cattle have manured, there's a very, very big difference in um, the quality of the grass. So we want that quality of grass all over the whole area. Like this, you know, so. Um, very patchy sorghum germination there, but yet a very, very good millet germination there. Um, just uh, just patchy just because of the rain. Um, quite a few variables involved in that too, including um, the way the seed was pressed in, there quite, quite a few variables, but um, I think the rain's got largely most, most got, mostly got to do with it, you know. But that's where we're at. We need to help this grass. So that's the, um, the next job that we're going to start. The boom sprayer is uh, fixed and um, that and we're going to start laying the irrigation infrastructure in the main grid of irrigation which I'll certainly update about that and how we're going to go about it but you know that involves about 300 meters of 50 mil high pressure pipe so it's going to be a big job and it's not going to be cheap but it has to be done and once it's in it's in there for good so there we are the sun's shining bright we just need to give that uh, <laughs> the grass a few more minerals so it can um, photosynthesize a bit more efficiently and make make the most of the water and sunshine that is now available late afternoon, overcast day, it's really just the perfect opportunity to put bioperts over the grasses on the syntropic patch.
So here's a grass recovery after the cut. Let's have a look at our winners and losers. This is coming from a first uh, time at a different management method where we let the grasses grow out through their S curve. So we've got lower succession grasses, Kikuyu, uh, but what's winning is the giant Paspalum. It's by far the tallest. It's responded best. The Rhodes grass is going all right too. It's quite good, but yes, the Rhodes is very good. So it's the, the giant Paspalum is the easiest to see, but the Rhodes and the Paspalum are coming out in front by a mile. This has only been a week. And it's a, they're, they're streaking ahead of the other lower succession grasses. So that's a good sign. So we keep this up and we'll see if we can get them all those species to dominate. Hi everyone, this is the update on the mulch that I've just rolled up into lines without any ground prep. Didn't do anything to the grass except cut it as I cut the whole lot of it. And uh, as you can see, there's been a really strong recovery in the grass. It's pretty strong, a lot of rain and heat, but the grass lines are holding their own quite a good outcome just goes to show you that um, you know by, just by managing the resources you can you can pretty much get what you want without having to spend too much money you just have to add the factor of time there's no instant results but they're pretty quick so yes this is what it looks like underneath Very wet, quite puggy, but that's just the nature of this paddock. But there's no grass there, nothing alive, no crowns that have survived. Some have poked through, but for the first time, that's pretty good. Here we are again. So the old C4 grass is a hard one to stop, but you use it against itself and it works. You use all that prolific biomass to um, pile it into windrows and then it the team seems to keep out. So there we go. I'll do another update again soon and I'll, I'll slash it and I will um, roll it up again. Hopefully make them bigger. All right, consortium. Got a jackfruit, and then in three meters we've got another jackfruit, and in between will be a eucalypt, courtesy of Revel. So what Rev's doing is he's going to plant the the eucalypt in between the two jackfruit, so it's a seedling tree every 1.5 meters with uh, three meters between each eucalypt, three meters between each 
jackfruit. Now the seed cups are ready to go and they're going to be planted with, that seed group's going to be planted with the eucalypt and here's how. So in goes the eucalypt. And to the north side of the eucalypt in a groove goes the seed group like that and then there's the eucalypt and then they can all germinate under the protection of the eucalypt and they're all covered up and why they're to the north the reason they're to the north is most of them are lower succession so they're going to need the light and that's it it's really simple it's just a simple matter of this. The consortium is high strata, um, jackfruit with a leading emergent nurse of and a biomass producer, which is the eucalypt, and then the jackfruit. So the jackfruit are every three metres, and in about four or five years, every second one will get cut out, and then there will be a jackfruit every uh, every six. Uh, Sorry, every nine metres or something like that. It'll depend on what it looks like at the time. So they'll be pruned out as they need space because jackfruit can be planted even closer than this because they produce it like two years old and as little trees. So you can actually plant a jackfruit every one metre if you want. And uh, in between the eucalypt and the jackfruit on the south side where we'll plant a small seed group just a little seed bomb of coffee white cedar and pigeon pea which is a short life cycle high strata followed by a longer life cycle high strata which is the pigeon pea is a short life cycle and the white cedar is the the long life cycle high strata and they'll be complemented by a low strata which is coffee so it's a high low with two highs separated by life cycle and we will pop them in on the south side in between where we go rev in here mate i reckon here so we're just basically go halfway between oh no we'll go there yeah onto the to the south side yeah. of the uke, so right, right here. Clip, yeah, right here. And we'll fill in these gaps. That's what these seed bombs will do. They fill the gaps in. Yep. And also with each jackfruit is a castor oil seed and a Mexican fern tree seed. So the castor oil will be a canopy to protect the young jackfruit seedling. And then as that gets cut, uh, cut away, the Mexican fern tree will be a higher canopy to protect and, and nurse the jackfruit until it needs to be cut out. So in the early days, what, what it's going to look like is this, it's going to be castor oil because it'll be the first plant coming up in this seed group with the eucalypt. <clears throat> castor oil in 1.5 metres. Pigeon pea, castor oil, castor oil, pigeon pea. That's what it'll look like in the first six to eight weeks. So here it is after the second grass cut. Really nice, uh, very solid lines of biomass. Very big and deep. So this, is the, this has been applied. As it's a second application to the uh, rows that have already been biomass. So we're still three rows between each row that need filling in. So the next cut, I believe we will be able to do every second row this one you can see the bananas coming up we just cut them back again when the uh, grass needs to be cut and mulch over the top of them and they'll poke up through the mulch that's no problem and uh, yeah it's a bit we've got more, more biomass this cut uh, and so just through management and a bit of application of this and that it is it is uh, getting better but yeah once when we were planting in these today many 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 more worms and really good soil structure so it's all working it's all happening 
And that's the most important thing, that things are always getting better through our actions and planting. So we just finished planting that jack, jackfruit consortium. And uh, there's more of those bananas. And that's our first consortium we've planted. And as far as the tree, tree rows go, it's Centropia's farm. Very hot today, so humid. <laughs> it's a seriously tropical day, I'm soaked. Absolutely soaked. But all the plants are loving it. We're going to grow some great plants, good crops this season. We just planted today, we're expecting a lot of rain and, uh, and a lot of growth. We put a lot of plants in today and, and uh, it's gonna go really, really strongly in these conditions. It's a bit hard on the humans today, but yeah, everything we're planting today, particularly plants like taro and that, bananas and stuff and jackfruit, they're just loving this, they're gonna love it. So here's the patch where it's just grass used as a management and preparation tool, just managing grass instead of prepping the ground with rotary hose and rippers. And here it is again. This is after the management. So it's looking pretty good. It's getting better. It's getting better and better now. So let's have a look. I've got to dig down a lot deeper now. There's just a lot of well-rotted biomass in there. So no grassing under there anymore. All of this mulch has certainly taken care of it. And we've got ourselves a pretty fertile paddock that's going to carry a lot of plants. So it's working out. So next time it'll be even better. Everything's growing really well today very hot and humid. Very good weather for the grass and bananas and the taro. Alright, I'm going to show you how to plant a medium strata banana in a syntropic system. So there's a lot of there's a bit of syntropic methodology and technique in this. Okay, so this is a medium strata banana, this is a plantain. If it was a high strata banana, it'd be a bit different. It'd be different plants with it. So this is a basically a this is a very basic consortium. So what we do is we have our banana. We have an eye here on the plantain. So what we're going to do first is we're going to put in some rock phosphate, and there's a little bit of Johnson Sioux compost in there too for inoculation. So what we do is we plant the banana 45 degrees like that. So this eye shoots and it grows around and up like that. And then the roots grow down here and it anchors the banana in really nice and deep. And it can throw more and more suckers from nice and deep down in the ground. And we're gonna have a really good uh, clump of bananas for many years. So down it goes like this. And then we fill it back up with dirt. Like so, the rain will settle that down. Now, here's the important bit. Here's where it's a consortium. Look at that big bugger. Plenty of these in here. Now, what we're going to do now is first up, I'll show you here, is a eucalyptus. Now that eucalyptus is on the north side of the banana because the eucalyptus is emergent, needs all of the sun. The banana is medium, doesn't need all of the sun, likes a bit of shade. But also what we're going to do is we're going to put a faster emergent in, which is castor oil, plant them seeds with the banana. The banana's going to be happy under the shade of the castor oil, especially coming into the cool months. The castor oil is going to protect it from any frost that might uh, set or develop. And we're also going to put in leucina, which is high strata, which will overposition the banana, but that's okay because the lacina is tough, it's going to hang in there. While the banana grows, the, the, the lacina will be shaded, get weedy and leggy, fine. But we're, what we'll do is when the banana's bunched, we cut out the banana, bang, the lacina will grow like hell and it'll make a big, it'll fill in that space beautifully until the next banana comes. So we've got short life cycle emergent, which is the castor oil, 
long last, longer life cycle emergent, which is the eucalypt with a high strata space filler that, over, that overpositions. I just thought I'd share an update on the first consortium we planted. So it's a jackfruit consortium with a jackfruit every three meters, one there, one there. In between every jackfruit is a eucalypt. And with every jackfruit is Mexican fern tree and castor oil. So they to cover it because you can see it's getting sunburnt. But it's all happening now. The whole all the placenta too is taking off. Castor oil, pigeon pea, and all of these other tree species are coming up. We've even got, you know, there's leguminous and non-leguminous species. Uh, and so every 1.5 metres is a planting. Actually, every 750, I, I should say, every 1.5 metres is a tree emergent, a, major, a seedling tree. Every... Um, 750 in between is a seed bomb and so what the aim is is to get the canopy over this as soon as possible with placenta two plants mostly pigeon pea and castor oil but there will be others but what's um really quite impressive is the speed of the mexican fern tree which is really really moving along you know it's really just busting out of the ground It's even faster than the castor oil. Lots of different trees germinating. There's so many of these leguminous species, I, I just can't keep track of them now. I didn't discriminate and uh, I put everything that I could in. And uh, we're getting great results. And that was because I just grabbed everything I could. All of these trees. And that's, you know, it's, that's getting this strong um, representation or expression of life is what you get when you don't spend too long worrying about what you're going to plant and what species you're going to plant, but instead just get everything you can plant and manage. So it really is quite simple. So, uh, look, you know, I'm really looking forward to sharing some more updates more mexican fern tree this is moving really quickly of course we're in peak growing season it's warm and wet but uh this is what we're after is you know just filling all the spaces in with as many plants as we can and then managing and not being too fussy about what goes in but just you know there is a bit of conscientiousness with strata and life cycle particularly in some seed consortiums which i'll keep sharing but it's not that difficult i just really want to share how simple it really is and how easy it really is it's just the hardest part is managing and getting the biomass the hardest part as well is just being open to getting every seed you can get and just putting as many as you can in without thinking too much you know, we're mindful about some target seed species. You know, I really want to get some bunya pine in and some black bean, but outside of that, there's a couple of others, but outside of that, I really just put everything we can in. Um, but it's really about getting that biomass up and management based really. So yeah, hopefully that's a bit more of an insight and I'll keep doing an update every week because it's growing really quickly.
I've got a tomato cutting here. Uh, I think with agroforestry, when you get good plants, you know, I really think cuttings work really well because, uh, you know, we've got, we create so many, all of these great conditions for plants where they thrive, unlike ordinary agriculture. We've got to service them all of the time. But uh, I'm going to experiment today. Um, I'll probably, yeah, I'll probably cut that off. And what have we got? Got a small piece of growth there. So what I'll do, no, I won't. Normally I would cut that off, that big leaf off and let that small piece of growth there go, take over. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to leave that leaf on and see what happens. I don't think it's a, <laughs> I don't think it's a very good idea. I don't think it's necessary at all, but I'm having a bit of a play. Uh, and without doing that, I don't learn. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to plant a, a tomato cutting in next to right in the same hole as a cassava cutting because the tomato and the cassava are practically lovers the way they grow together so let's see how they start together at the very beginning so here's my cassava cutting that I've got in the ground already <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'm going to pull that back one-handed I'm holding the camera I'm going to poke that in nice and deep down there there we go put that back and then I I'll uh, just push a bit and there they are and let's see how they grow um, the cassava will shoot, it'll shoot and it'll grow up. The tomato will probably be a bit slower. The cassava will throw a bit of shade onto the tomato and then the tomato will climb up the cassava. And I usually do it that way. I usually um, let the cassava be the support for the tomato. And if I have to take some leaves off the cassava, I will. But it's a wonderful way to grow these plants. And uh, I'll just quickly show you this is impromptu and uh, chaotic. This is just not a managed example, but I'll show you, even though we're left unmanaged and just in the neglected, how well the tomato and the cassava go. You know, this tomato has been through the flood, mind you. They should, they should die. They should be dead, but um, no. Instead, it wants to give us fruit and food. But, you know, tomato cuttings and cassava is something that I'm going to experiment more with. Let's see how it goes. Let's um, see if, you know, follow it along and see if it's a winner or a loser. But it's a minimal effort thing. It's, there's no effort in the nursery. It's all just in the paddock with your secateurs and machete. It's just smash it out in 50 metre or 100 metre rows. It's really, really easy to do. Hasn't rained in weeks. The roads are all dry, everything's dried out, but got all of this mulch. And it's beautiful and wet in here. Beautiful. Don't need irrigation. We're just planting into it like we've planted everything else. You don't need irrigation. This is what it looks like without mulch.
So here's the nursery consortium for the jackfruit. Here's the jackfruit. It's really happy, it's healthy, it's beautiful. It's in its own natural nursery. It's a castor oil, which is an emergent and covering it up. It's, but the castor oil is being followed by the tithonia, no, the um, schizolabium, the gutaputavu, which will eventually take the job of the castor oil the whole while nursing this jackfruit and covering it up until the jackfruit's ready to stand out on its own and then it will be growing um, as in complement with the rest of the trees that are growing each side of it. But that's how that little nursery consortium works for the jackfruit. This is a quick video to show, to share a uh, tarot experiment that we're doing here at Syntropia's farm. Um, so what's going on is uh, we've planted all of this tarot for hurley production. It's not for root crop. It's not for crop production. It's for hoolies to plant out into the rest of the system. So first up, it's not in an agroforestry system. It's not within a complex macroorganism that we develop with agroforestry. It's just in a um, savannah ecology at the moment. Now what we're doing is we're testing management. So here there's been zero ground prep, just grass management. So we've killed the grass by using the grass. We've just concentrated the grass in lines and it's created an ecology underneath it. It's full of worms, so we know the soil is good. There are some deficiencies popping up here and there, but it's no big deal because it is improving. As you can see, that's a massively good leaf. There's a lot of this sort of stuff going on. We've got some really good stuff. There's no fertilizer used. I did inoculate it with Johnson Sioux compost and other mycorrhiza but what it is it's planted in a straight line hay rake up each side roll it on tarot pushes through and there you go easy as very 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 small amount of labor this is just a matter of a couple of hours at every time it's really not much there was a couple of days planting and that's only done once with this sort of thing and then it's just every uh, sort of six weeks, cut the grass and roll it up. And it takes about two hours to do that. And that's it. So it doesn't get away on us. It keeps getting better because we're managing the grass. We are adding biology to the grass. We actually, you know, it's more about investing in the grass than it is investing in these lines. These lines are more of a uh, consequence of grass management. So it's all about the grass. There'll be more about that, but uh, yeah, that's where the focus is, is actually improving grass. Uh, so yeah, like I said, it's not in an agroforestry system yet, because what the whole idea of this is to test the methodology, the management, to test how we can put this into a system and get high production and with low input, low management. Um, so that's the idea and it's working better than it's working as as good as you hope you know when you you lay in bed and think about it and you're always looking for that that magic moment when you get it right this is kind of getting there uh so when we plant these hoolies these hoolies will be planted out further back into the agroforestry we will double the density we will have a a staggered pattern 
and still push the grass up from each side and we'll have probably only about two to 300 millimetres, not even 300 millimetres between taro plants. The reason being is um, the taro has got reach outward. It can move out. It's not in a t traditional taro patch where it's just a big block of taro. So the taro can be planted really, really closely together in a staggered pattern and push out that way. That's the idea. The other reason too is we don't need big corms. Our market doesn't want big corms. Our market wants a corm from about, th about averaging bet between 300 and 400 grams a piece. So we'll probably even harvest them early and, and get a, you know, it's more about density and uh, numbers of roots rather than um, the weight of each root for us. And we will move this into an agroforestry system. Now, what we're going to do, because we'll be planting hoolies next for production, is we will actually mechanically prepare the soil. This is just an ecological experiment to see what management of plants does to prepare the ground and get the results we're after. It's just an experiment and it's done the job. It's made us, it's given us a um, nursery of, of planting stock. From that, we have to apply it to the agroforestry in the production context. And we will put two rip lines in 300 millimeters apart for planting the hoolies in because you just pop them in deep. You know, that's how you plant hoolies. That's how you do it for production. So we're doing it that way and we're going to remove that labor cost. You know, and it will be a very, very low labor cost as compared to what it took to plant this out, which was relatively small because you just do it once here. But that's the um, management concept, looking for that ecological feedback that I'm sharing here. And yes, it will be under a big agroforestry system, which adds a hell of a lot to particularly taro production uh, as we go. There'll be a lot more plants and trees in there and eucalypts and there'll be castor oil planted over all of the um, taro, etc. So on its own, just with grass, this taro has done remarkably well with zero inputs except for inoculant. I'm just in the jackfruit consortium again. And it's now time to start cutting back the castor oil. The castor oil is starting to put its energy into reproduction. So senescence is coming about, but not only that, it's over positioning the eucalyptus. So the castor oil has already fulfilled its role as the first emergent. And it is the first plant to be pruned and to put growth pulses into the new consortium. So here's an update on the highly area specific consortium that nurses the jackfruit. Of course, the whole thing is a consortium in combination, but as one element within this consortium is a cons another consortium. It's a little bit confusing, but that's how it works. Um, this was the one where the jackfruit is nursed by the castor oil, provides the early emergent shade, and then the castor oil is followed by the schizolobium, which you can see here. So we're at the stage now where we can cast, cut the castor oil away and allow the schizolobium to do its job. Now, the influence is starting to come from the plants around it now. And we're going into a um, time of the year where the, the sun isn't as strong. So now we can prune back the castor oil. It's going to seed too, bringing senescence. And we can just bring in that little bit of light now to expose the, uh, not just the jackfruit, but more importantly, the schizolobium to start taking the, the role of the castor oil. The castor oil will still remain for a little bit longer, but now we're managing it. And uh, it's important to note right here that syntropic agriculture is a management-based system. So the consortium can't exist without, it. we can't function the way we want it without our intervention. 
So what I'm doing here is the first management of a jackfruit consortium. So what I'm doing is I'm managing the castor oil. The castor oil is the first high performing plant to peak in its usefulness, in its role of supporting the agroforestry. As you can see, the castor oil is putting its energy into reproduction and it's created enough shade to nurse the jackfruit below it and the other plants around it, pigeon pea, etc., are going to help nurse the jackfruit now. But the castor oil won't entirely disappear, it'll be managed back. So that's all we need to do. And that'll send a growth pulse into the uh, consortium. It'll release gibberellic acid. Now here we have a castor oil that doesn't need to be pruned just yet. But most of them do. As you can see, we have seed being uh, that are developing. So we can just um, take that out very simply and easily. All of the plants get a little bit of a growth pulse. And more light comes in. And everything benefits on the life that the castor oil has brought with it. All of that biomass will shrink away and incorporate. No need to worry about being too tidy as long as we don't cover up too many plants. The machete is a very good tool once you learn how to use it. Functions as a hook and you don't really have to do that much. With the other hand, except use your phone to share. very quick affair. Always give it an extra chop on the ground just to help it rot down. The castor oil doesn't produce a significant amount of biomass, but it does produce a lot in supporting the soil life and sending growth hormones. Very, very useful plant. There's always multiple roles that any one plant plays. Just take that seed off, like that. Same here. And I should have the whole road pruned in less than five minutes. Let's see. It's a little bit weaker down this end because this is where it was flood affected. And there we have it. That's just been managed. So what will happen is the castor oil <clears throat> will flush again and go back into reproduction and then we'll prune it again. It won't take long for that to happen because the castor oil has fulfilled its role and reproduction is its uh, goal now. So the next plant that will benefit from this will be the pigeon pea, which is doing very well. It's still warm enough for it to grow, even though we're going into autumn. But yes, we'll prune the castor oil one more time before taking it out completely. And then this cycle continues through species succession from castor oil to pigeon pea to 
cassia through to eucalypt and to all of the other high succession species all the way up until we got a full forest so we manage species succession that's how one fundamental part of syntropic agriculture we we manage species succession through the interface of a consortium Ban long Ban long taro It's never too wet for Ban long taro So it's been exactly seven days <clears throat> since I pruned the castor oil in this jackfruit consortium. <clears throat> so I thought I would share the results, show you what happened. So there's been clearly, there's clearly been a response, a growth pulse. So pruned. Castor oil and about three new leaves. Just one, two, and there's a third there starting off. Probably about 50% increase in mass on that plant, I would estimate. Up to 50%. And uh, the castor oil is flowering again. I just disturbed the native bees. The native bees really love the castor oil. Right now, there's not much around that the native bees are using, but um, the castor oil is certainly providing for them. We've got a lot of new growth on the pigeon pea, certainly taking its place. Taking the castor oil's place. This jackfruit's probably, this is the one I showed last time. There's nearly, well, I don't know. It's probably, it's, 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 Definitely growing a lot, definitely more than 50% increase in mass on that plant in seven days. All of the hormones, what happens is the, the information shared by the plants, once there's been disturbance, when it's timed right, it needs to be timed the right way in the way, the framework of managing a consortium. But when it's done, we get the results. This is one of the quintessential functions of the of syntropic agriculture is how this consortium is managed precisely. Here's more again. There's a clear jump, even with the sisolobium, a massive jump. <coughs> so I know there are more questions than answers once this information is shared. So the easiest thing to do is to go to my website, uh, syntropia.com.au and then go to the uh, page resources. And there you'll find a consortium text sheet and go through that. That's the best thing I can do to help sort of introduce you to how a consortium really works. So check out that tech sheet and start from there if you want to learn more. Here's a quick observation. One thing I would really liked would be poultry on this grass here, some pastured poultry. That would be awesome. But right now I just can't carry it. It's not in my context. Uh, I don't have the resources. I wish I did, but I don't. 
But as you can see, there's a lot of bird life at the moment. Heaps and heaps and heaps of bird life. Because this is uh, quite a swampy area. Or it's not swampy, but it gets inundated a lot. You know, periodically. But what's happened is we've created these mulch lines which have focused fertility and supporting this taro crop, these taro plants, the crop here. So that's what we've got. And we've got a great taro system already in place, even though it's only a month, it's probably about two months old. But what's happened is the birds have started to interact with this fertility that's here. And you can see it, you know, there's lots and lots of holes that the birds have made as they feed and there's an interaction happening now so we're attracting more and more birds and before I walked here it's a bit hard to see now I scared off a flock that was way bigger than a poultry flock that I would have had and I'm getting the results the chooks give I'm getting the droppings everywhere I'm getting bird poo everywhere I look all over the place everywhere you know it's just everywhere so what I've done accidentally or just you know through I mean the ecosystem assembles itself it's self-organizing and it's you know ecology agroecology or regenerative agriculture is all based on positive feedbacks of a uh, ecologically driven system. So here's the positive feedback. So the birds are coming. I'm getting the fertilizer. There's just poo everywhere. And <laughs> I'm really happy about that. <laughs> so these birds are magnificent. There's a magpie over there. But yes, there's very, very big flocks of uh, crows they've come up for some reason plover um heaps and heaps and heaps of ibis you know there's just um they've just been here in huge flocks so here we have the bananas that have been in for about uh probably about 12 weeks now these bananas, this is a banana row that it's just planted in a really basic consortium with pigeon pea and castor oil. And this is for planting stock. So they're throwing suckers that will be, will be all planted out in the consortium throughout the whole paddock next spring. This is a, these bananas are Ducasse. We've chosen Ducasse for a number of reasons. Very fast producing bunches, fast bunch production big bunches, good market for them with the Asian market, which is where we, we aim. Um, so yeah, they're, they're really, I mean, here they're suckering off beautifully already. Beautiful new leaves coming out. These are very, very healthy and fast growing plants. You can see there's beautiful new leaves. Uh, many suckers coming up, you know, they, these suckers are all throwing new leaves. Even as it's cooling down, we're getting vigorous and vigorous and fast growth out of these plants that was a stump a couple of weeks ago so as you can see new leaves beautiful beautiful new leaf that and another one coming again beautiful beautiful new leaves and beautiful new growth even as it's cooling off and the season's ending we're getting a lot out of these plants again just pure health and this is largely due to grass management because what we've done is we've created awesome topsoil by managing just these big lines of mulch it's really really easy to just not notice but i tell you what have a look at the bananas that are in the grass over here as, for, as a uh, comparison. They're poor, very poor. That was, a, that was a mistake that was made, putting those bananas in there because I anticipated more mulch and biomass. 
I didn't get enough mulch and biomass, so I couldn't carry that row. But I could only carry every other row. But look at the difference. Just managing grass into lines and the ecological feedback give you crop, huge crop. And these bananas will be bunching very, very uh, early next season. Look at these beautiful leaves. It's just fantastic and they're big. They're very big. It just goes to show you how powerful grass management is and how mindful we've got to be of grass management as opposed to spraying it all of the time with Roundup or cutting it all the time when it gets too long. No, work with the grass, allow it to lead us into species succession and it will give you so much more back. It's so simple. Do it.